Let's turn in our Bibles, <coughs> excuse me, to the second chapter of Matthew, Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, on this Epiphany Sunday. Did you know it was Epiphany Sunday? No, well, good for you. Uh, <laughs> I thought I might catch you by surprise. That's why the lights are still up and trees and Advent wreath and so forth. The word epiphany, you know what that means? It's like an oral exam this morning, isn't it? Uh, means uh, manifestation or illumination. You, you say, I've had an epiphany. And it means you've seen the light. You know, you've come to understand something. You've seen something you didn't see before. So... In the history of the church, Epiphany Sunday, really since the second century, has uh, been associated with the manifestation of the Messiah to the Gentile world in the persons of the wise men. So that's why we still have the lights up and it's still Christmas around here. And um, while we look at this narrative this morning, the visit of the wise men to see uh, the little child Jesus. Epiphany Day is actually January the 6th. That's a constant and um, really concludes the, the 12 days of Christmas, which you've heard about. It concludes that and uh, uh, liturgically concludes the Christmas season. So it's been nice having these friends here <laughs> with me uh, these past weeks. We'll have to wait until next Advent before we see the lights once again. Let's pray and we'll jump right in. Lord God, thank you for this morning and thank you for your many blessings for a wonderful Christmas season and now for the new year. And uh, may your light continue to shine upon us, your face shine upon us. May you lift your countenance upon us. And may we go forth uh, this year in this fallen world to let our light shine before men, not to the end that they would glorify us, but they would... Uh, see our light, see our good works, and bring glory to your name. Uh, to that end, uh, we pray for your light to shine upon us as we look at your word now, that you would take away our sluggishness, uh, our perhaps our apathy, and kindle afresh a zeal to know you, Lord Jesus, and to serve you in the days ahead. For your honor and glory, we pray. Amen. Matthew 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Have you ever had the uh, awkward experience of receiving a, a gift, a Christmas gift perhaps, or a birthday gift uh, that you really didn't like? Uh, maybe you didn't uh, know what it was. 
or, or maybe you didn't you knew what it was, but you know, knew you didn't need it, or maybe you just flat out didn't like it. And it's awkward because the giver is in the room with you and you have to put on a happy face and you have to say the right things and kind of pretend like you're grateful while inside you're, you're groaning about uh, what to do with this gift that you don't like. Once upon a time there were four wealthy Jewish brothers uh, who were bragging about the gifts they had given to their elderly mother. Uh, their mother saw it a little differently. Brother number one, <coughs> Milton, said, I built a big house for Mama. Menachem, brother number two, said, I had a $100,000 theater built in her house. Brother number three, Marvin, said, I had my Mercedes dealer deliver her an SL600 with a chauffeur. Brother number four, Melvin, said, listen to this. You know how Mama loves reading the Torah, and you know she can't see very well, so I sent her a parrot that can recite the entire Torah. <laughs> it took 20 rabbis nearly 12 years to teach him. I had to promise to give $100,000 a year for 20 years, but it was worth it. Mama just has to name the chapter and verse, and the parrot will recite it. Well, <clears throat> soon thereafter, Mama sent her thank you notes. She wrote, Milton, the house you built is so huge, I only live in one room, but I have to clean the entire house. Thanks so much. Menachem, you gave me a theater with Dolby sound. It could hold 50 people but all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing and I'm nearly blind, thanks anyway. Marvin, I'm too old to drive a car. I stay home, I have my groceries delivered so I never use the Mercedes and the driver is a Nazi. <laughs> a million thanks. But dearest Melvin, you were the only one to have the good sense to give, give a little thought to your gift. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> <clears throat> what we have here in, uh, in Matthew, this account of the wise men are some the men who had the good sense to bring some very thoughtful gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether he knew what they were, whether he appreciated them or not is questionable, if not doubtful. He was quite young, uh, just a very young child. The visit of the wise men was uh, surprising and scary and sacred. So let's think about those three things briefly. First of all, surprising. Verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You see that little word, behold, I didn't read it correctly a moment ago. Uh, I should have had more volume. I should have had more excitement. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold! Because that's the sort of passion and excitement that Matthew intends to, to uh, create, the same sort of excitement when the wise men saw the star, behold! He's saying, this, this is noteworthy. This doesn't happen every day. Now, this is uh, unbelievable. Wise men from the east. Can you believe it? Is what he's saying. Now, why was it so surprising? Well, for several reasons. One, they lived a long way away. Far off geographically. Babylon, perhaps, Persia, perhaps, India, perhaps, maybe even beyond. 
Because it was a long trip, arduous, difficult, maybe dangerous. Took months, maybe a year. But they came. Though they were far off geographically. And secondly, far off spiritually. Because as a group, the wise men were pagans and Gentiles and uh, fire worshipers and nature worshipers and they practiced sorcery and they practiced divination and all sorts of things the Bible forbids. But still they came. And the third reason is that they were, third reason it was surprising is that they were prominent people. The hymn calls them kings. They were, they were wealthy, they were influential, they were very powerful uh, uh, people. Uh, Josephus, the uh, great uh, historian, in fact, tells us that the, uh, uh, no man ever became king without the scrutiny and approval of the wise men. They essentially were the king makers and the king advisors and uh, nobility and the extremely prominent. So they were the very sort of people that the Apostle Paul says you don't find many of in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians, not many wise, not many noble, not many influential, according to worldly standards, have been called into the kingdom of God. But these men saw a star, and they embraced the messianic expectation, and behold, they made a long trip to worship the newborn king. Unbelievable is what Matthew's saying. Not only was the visit surprising, it was also scary to some. Verse 3, <clears throat> when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod, Herod the Great, as he was called, was... Uh, hopelessly jealous and incredibly suspicious and wretchedly insecure. And yet he was the king of the Jews. So anyone that threatened him, he just killed them. He killed his wife. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed three of his own sons. The third one five days before he died. But even later in life, he was still insecure. The expression arose that it was better to be Herod's swine than Herod's son. Herod was an Edomite. The Edomites came from Esau. Esau and Jacob, uh, you remember, they wrestled in, the, in their mother's womb, foreshadowing the conflict that would emerge between these two groups, these two nations. It was the Edomites that refused to allow Israel passage on the Exodus. It was the Edomites that were always giving the Israelites uh, great uh, difficulty. So you say to yourself, how in the world did an Edomite become king of the Jews? Well, the answer, first of all, it was not by popular vote. <laughs> I can assure you of that. It was that Herod scratched and clawed his way into favor with Rome over a period of time. So much so that finally by the year 40 B.C., uh, the Roman Senate appointed Herod king of the Jews and gave him some troops to quell any rebellions that might arise, which he was more than happy to use whenever necessary. So you understand, with this kind of king on the throne, when he heard that these Wealthy, powerful Gentiles had come this great distance to worship who? The king of the Jews? Well, he thought to himself, I thought I was the king of the Jews. There's not room for two kings of the Jews, right? So he was troubled. Now, these wise men showed up. Legend tells us there are three. The Bible doesn't tell us that. The hymn tells us that. The anthem tells us that. There are three gifts. May have been more. I would say probably were more. But showed up wearing their long flowing robes and all their regalia and riding on their 
Persian steeds and accompanied by their crack troops. Oh, Herod noticed. And all Jerusalem noticed. And it was a recipe for serious trouble. As we discover reading on through the second chapter of Matthew. A very surprising visit. Unfortunately for some, a very scary visit. The wise men were overjoyed with a great joy, the text says. But Herod and all Jerusalem were troubled. And third, <clears throat> it was a sacred visit, a worshipful visit. <clears throat> Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down. Then entered in, what is it, reverently those wise men and fell reverently upon their knee to, to him. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother and they fell down and worshiped him. I'm going to tell you, they didn't fall down for anybody. People fell down before them. But on this occasion, <laughs> the wise men recognized something special. They had seen a star that embraced the messianic expectation propagated perhaps by Daniel and some of his friends centuries earlier. We don't know. But they had embraced that messianic expectation. They knew they were before the king of kings and lord of lords no matter how young he was. And they fell down and prostrated themselves before him and worshipped him, foreshadowing the great day when every knee will bow. Every tongue confess his lordship. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's a picture, isn't it, of the first fruits of the gospel. I mean, you realize Jesus hasn't, he hasn't preached a, a sermon yet. He hadn't performed a miracle. He's just a young child in this home. But people from far away were being drawn to him, prominent people. What did the prophet say? But I'll make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Here it is happening already. His salvation has a long reach to it. And later, Jesus, as a grown man, would say many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. It's happened for a long time. It's happening now, and it'll happen until the end of the age when that, that other, another great hymn writer says, from earth's wide bounds and ocean's farthest coast through gates of pearl, stream in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. Alleluia. You see, the power of the gospel reaches every nation, tribe, people, language, the ends of the earth. No one's too far away. No one's too unspiritual, too unclean. In fact, I challenge you to think about the fact that the Lord seems to love to save those that are the farthest away, the ones we would consider the least likely to be saved, the most unclean, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the real bad sinner, a Samaritan woman. Who would have ever thought that a man, a uh, Japanese fighter pilot, who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, Mitsuo Fuchida, would later become a Christian? And not just a Christian, but a missionary. Who would have ever thought that an a atheist, intellectual, Oxford professor, by the name of Clive Staples Lewis, who wasn't looking for God any more than a mouse is ever looking for a cat, 
would embrace the gospel, be surprised by joy, become an outspoken Christian, and an artist that's probably blessed every one of us in this room to this day. C.S. Lewis. Who'd have thought that a, a German university professor, the first female ever to reach that, that rank in the German university, Etta Linneman, famous for her books of skepticism about the New Testament, would later burn those books and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Would you ever have thought that three members of the Charles Manson crime family would be born again in prison? Those of you old enough to remember Watergate, would you ever have thought that that ruthless lawyer, hatchet man, named Chuck Colson, would bow his head upon the steering wheel and weep and be born again and have a life radically changed? And start a wonderful worldwide prison ministry known as Prison Fellowship? You ever heard of, uh, sorry, I can't remember the lady's name right now. I want to say Joy Lewis, but that's not it. Anyway, she was the press secretary for the National Organization for Women. <laughs> and a lesbian and a radical feminist and a woman who led the grassroots effort to defeat Clarence Thomas's nomination for the Supreme Court. And later, the power of the gospel changed that woman's life. And today, she is a senior writer for Focus on the Family magazine and organization. These are just a few examples. And it happens time and time and time again. The reach of the gospel to the ends of the earth, those far away geographically, those far away spiritually, such were some of you, if not all. We were all far off, brought near by the, by the blood of Christ. And today these people, once so, once so arrogant and prideful, hard-hearted today, they fall before the Lord and they offer their gifts and they crown him with many crowns and they cast their crowns before him because they understand that he's worthy. These wise men offered thoughtful gifts. <laughs> Gold, appropriate for a king. Frankincense, sprinkled on the offerings and sacrifices so the sweet aroma would rise to God. And myrrh, to make us smell a little better. <laughs> Esther, when she was all dolled up and went to see the king, wore myrrh. John 19, Jesus was uh, anointed with myrrh as his body was prepared for burial. We sang in the bleak midwinter a few moments ago. I don't think we sang it too well, did we? Maybe we'll try again sometime. <laughs> But I love Christina Rossetti's words. What can I give him? Poor as I am. If I were a shepherd, I'd bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. But what I can, I give him. Give him my heart. And that's, that's what the wise men did. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh is just an expression of their heart. And I would say to you on this first Sunday of the new year, that's a good thing for all of us to do. That's the best New Year's resolution any of us will ever make. Lord, I'm going to give you my heart this year. I resolve once again to give you everything I have because you are worthy, worthy as a lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our trouble. He's worthy of our treasures and our talents. And he's worthy of our suffering. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our obedience. He's worthy of our finances. Is there anything he's not worthy of? 
And the wise men understood that. And they knew that the next time they would see Jesus would not be in that poor lowly stable, as another hymn says, not in that poor lowly stable with the oxen standing by. We shall see him, but in heaven. Set at God's right hand on high, when like stars his children crown, all in white shall wait around. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your work of grace in our lives and in so many other lives. These things are not reported in the media, but one by one, one soul at a time, you build your church, you advance your kingdom, you uh, increase your government, and so we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with uh, exceedingly great joy. Uh, thank you, Father, for your great salvation, for the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, and hasten that day when we will see him set in heaven, set at your right hand, and all of us crowned like stars, uh, clothed in white, fine linen given to the saints. Hasten that day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Father, bless us in this new year. Bless our church. Help us to serve you well, faithfully, giving our hearts to you. Bless those among us that are ill. And we know, Lord, there are numerous ones. But um, easy for you, Lord, for the finger of God to reach down and uh, touch these. And so we pray that you would have mercy on Tim Cummings and Alva Wolf, Michael Fleming, uh, Vernon Eads and Judy Gish and uh, Rob Michaels, Tina Gilchrist, Aretha Thomas, Juanita Fentress, and others, others that are shut in, others that are discouraged. Lift our hearts, Lord, and help us to see the great future that you have for all of us and the great present as well. And so give us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen.